Everybody had autonomous vehicles, and let's say we cut down accidents by, I don't know, 50% or something. I'm just pulling the number out, okay? Um, economically, that's not very good for the car industry. Uh, the automobile industry wouldn't like that. They like accidents. Uh, you destroy cars that way. The Insane Transformation Podcast, a paint-by-numbers approach to service design and innovation. The thought just occurred to me, a way to put it as a, a difficult contradiction, mm -hmm. a young high school kid, let's say a freshman, who is being bullied by a larger senior, mm -hmm. wants to not take any more crap and wants to keep you know, the big guy away. Um, but they know if they do anything too extreme to where, you know, if you punch them in the throat or something, it's going to get back to the hospital or to the principal. Yep. And you're going to be in big trouble here. If, if they find out even off campus, sometimes, if they find out that you've been fighting, you can be in trouble at school, which is just amazing to me. Um, but anyway, so how can you um, or what can you use? How, how can you approach? How could a kid approach that dilemma that I've had enough? Maybe I even want some revenge. And that's important to keep control over. Yeah. So from, from a jujitsu, well, I, I guess, uh, I think if you're thinking about the difference between Krav and jujitsu, I mean, even if you're using jujitsu and, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I mean, well, I'm not really familiar with, I've never practiced Krav, so I've just seen a lot of cool YouTube videos, but, um, but even with jujitsu, like you, you still have to put hands on the person. Right. So yeah. I guess the question is, do, it, is at that point, are you still like, I guess, are we talking about the difference between if you use Krav and you hit him in the throat versus if you use jujitsu you take them down and sort of get in mount and you sit on top of them and you maybe don't hurt them, but you can diffuse the situation. I guess the question is, is it, are you still in just as much trouble if you grab the person or is it more about the spectrum of if I punch them and I inflict some serious injury versus if I just take them down relatively gently and then get on top of them. But would you be in the same amount of trouble as a, as a freshman um, kid? Fighting. Uh, yes. If people decide to report it, however, I even thought about jujitsu and put them in some kind of submission hold or an arm mm -hmm. bar or something mm -hmm. where, you know, if you decide to tighten it up a little more, you're going to tear their rotator cuff or something, sure. but you can stop prior to that. And the big guy can tap out um, and say, okay, okay. Um, and there yeah. won't, you won't leave a mark. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. 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 I, I remember I, I was in quite a few fights um, in junior high and high school, quite a few actually. And I, I don't, and a lot of those fights were off campus. There was very few that were on campus, but yeah, that, that would always be the case. You're walk, you, you basically walk off the school grounds grounds and you agree to meet somewhere and then you have the fight. Um, but I guess the only thing I'm thinking of, and I, maybe this is kind of where it gets into this weird thing about jujitsu being, more focused on the ground in that one-on-one -on -one view where Krav is more standing and striking oriented. The fights that I was in, there was always a lot of people. And if you were getting the better of somebody, chances were another person was jumping in. Now they, they would always try to like keep, keep a space around you. But so then the only thing I'm thinking too about with Jiu Jitsu is in those environments, is it almost expected that you're not going to let your friend get beat up so even if the freshman gets on top of this person and they're not hitting them does someone see that they're being dominated and think they're losing and then does someone jump in um i mean i, I know that's not answering the question but i guess well it's, you're also very vulnerable if you're yeah. on top of the guy yeah mm. um, yeah yeah and that that's another experience i had too is uh where you're sort of you're engaging with person Y or X or whatever over here. And from uh, like the side of you or behind you or something, one of this person's friends 
will actually jump out and they'll hit you first or they'll, they'll tackle you. Um, so sometimes it's not even the person that's the aggressor that, that takes the first shot. Um, but I mean, I, I, I guess what I would say is just from my experience with people is that when you start, and this is, this has to be the same with Krav, I'm assuming, but your confidence goes up a lot. And when you start training, right. So, so it's almost like because you have more, much more confidence and you're quite comfortable in a fight, you're, you're almost like, well, if this person's talking to you, you're not as bothered by it. But I also think it comes through in the conversation that you're really not worried that this person's going to do anything. Yeah. Um, but was that, I'm not trying to change the conversation away from that, yeah. but it's all, it's almost like that kind of. Well, that um, leads to, uh, you know, I guess a solution area of, yeah. of course, the recommended step is try to diffuse the situation, leave mm. the situation, um, you know, never maybe go, stop going to bars. Maybe not that. <laughs> well, ho hopefully as a freshman, you're not going to bars, but you, <laughs> you might be here. Um, yeah, so I mean, that that's one though, stop it from the altercation from occurring. And then um, there's some psychological stuff about conveying that you're not scared, but also you're, you are ready though to yeah. defend yourself. Yeah. Um, I make the mistake when we're practicing, you know, we're, we're supposed to say stuff like back, I don't want to fight you. Yeah. And I always want to say to the guy, listen, if that gun is in my face for another half a second, yep. I'm going to shove it up your ass, pull the trigger. <laughs> yep. And they're like, what? Yep. <laughs> Probably not a good idea. But, yeah, uh, I think but, back when I, you know, back when I was a kid, I think fighting was different. <laughs> you know, that was a few years before you guys, mm -hmm. you know. But um, it was. I always felt that it was, um, you know, confidence was a big factor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, I didn't. I never backed down. Um, I didn't. I only knew how to street fight. You know, I never knew any fancy moves or anything like that. But um, if I was being bullied, I would move towards the person rather than away. Um, and sometimes very, very close, you know, like noses touching type thing, you know. Yeah. And um, a lot of times that was enough um, just to intimidate him. I mean, my body was as tense as a rock, um, yeah. you know, during that time. And I was ready to throw a punch if I had to. Um, but just the fact of moving towards versus moving away was enough, uh, along with the confidence that there was no fear in my eyes. Um, you know, yeah, you might get a shot in, but, you know, I'm going to get one in, too. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, you know, that was usually enough. And they didn't usually end up that bloody, you know, or that awful. Um, mm -hmm. you know? So maybe it's psychological, too. <clears throat> I, I think yeah. it is kind of changing that dynamic as far as the interaction between the two and, and realizing the, uh, the likely mindset that the aggressor has hmm. and trying to disrupt that, make them somewhat doubtful or confused, hmm. take away yeah. a little bit of confidence. Yeah. Um, right. So it's interesting to think too, what, what are other ways to upset their thinking process mm. or make them more nervous, um, more doubtful, really. Um, they don't know about you. They don't know what you're capable of. Right. Mm. And, um, and that planting that doubt um, is what I tried to do. You know, I was like, you don't, you don't know me. You don't know. I mean, unless you've, you know, unless we've done this before, right. you, know, you, you don't, you don't know that I'm probably not capable of very much, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm going to give it hell, you know. <laughs> I watched this uh, couple of funny YouTube videos by this guy. He calls himself Johnny Karate. And uh, he, he gives examples of, or he shows how someone comes up to him, I don't know, and ready to hit him or they have a gun. And one is he fakes a heart attack oh, as real as he can, yeah. goes to the ground. The other is he just starts sobbing 
crying or maybe talking about his wife and kids. And then as soon as the guy seems to have a tiny bit of empathy, he attacks. Um, so really kind of, or another one I, I did with a guy in class and it just broke him up um, was he had the gun in my face and I said, you know, this is weird, but I'm really attracted to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I pulled the trigger at that point. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, so, I guess the question, like, for, if if we actually go back to, okay, let's say you, you you're, look, it's the guy, the guys or gal or whoever or, or that person, that aggressor, is actually going to now strike you. I mean, that's the other thing is your de that distance management, right? Like. I think in your case, Don, like if that per if the person has gotten that close to me, that we're actually we're gonna fight, like, or, or I'm gonna take you down and just then move away from you or something. But I don't, because especially uh, with some of the folks that I've been around, that they'll come in, they'll come in close, and then there's they'll put their head down and they're pulling your face into their head and they're breaking your nose or something. Yeah, so yeah. at that point, it's quite bad. Yeah. But I guess the question is when when it gets to that point where they're you, you're you're going to have contact and this goes back to krav what do you do like what does krav actually teach you? i mean are you going to just you're going to elbow the guy and then you're going to move away are you are you actually trying to just completely destroy this person what, what, it's what, uh, what? especially we talked to a lot about realizing this day and age it's likely two or three people are recording what's happening uh, yep. and you want to be only do and it's always disappointing to me, they say you deliver uh, as many strikes as it's necessary to ensure that they're not going to be a threat, but not one more. Um, mm. I always want to go a couple more. But, yeah. but the thing is, um, uh, it's, they always kind of say, no, you'd be really stupid to even let the guy get up that close. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of trying to keep some distance. And then it's always you know, waiting for the other guy to make the slightest move, but, and, and also to understand their body language, if they kind of turn away for a minute, it might be likely they're coming around for a big uh -huh. haymaker. Um, and it's, it's, uh, I, I personally think that even though you might end up going to jail or be in trouble mm. in that situation, I, I'd want to be pr uh, preemptive. Mm -hmm. um, it's not going to be good if some guy's that close to me. Sure. Um, so I'd, I'd want to maybe headbutt him before he can yep. do it to me or knee yep. him. Or, um, yep. But that's, and, and, it, yeah. And I guess it would change too. Like if you, and I, I don't know if it's the same for you, but like if I'm with my kids, for instance, my like threat level or my aggression level is like exponentially higher like I, I had, there was a situation not long ago where I was walking with my daughter and some guy um, basically started to flip out on the streets because he thought I was staring at him. He ran across the street. It was, there was construction and I was looking in that direction and he thought I was staring at him. He actually ran across the street to me and started to get in my face. And so I just pushed my daughter away. But at that point, like it wasn't, I wasn't going to take him down. I was going to inflict like, because there, there was no, I didn't want him. I didn't want to risk potentially getting knocked out. And then what happens to my daughter? I didn't want to risk him getting back up. So in that case, I was going to like inflict some serious damage to him. But yeah. I guess that would be the same for you. And I suppose the question is, how do you know though, if you're, if you're starting to hit someone, because you, you don't want to just hit them once because especially if they're drunk or something like that, they can take a lot of damage. So how, like, how do you know, I guess you have to, what do you hit them until they stop moving or what do you, do you hit them once and then look at them and see if they're, if they're doing, well, what do you do? Well, that's uh, sometimes they claim they've gotten the input, but I don't know. I'd like to bring a um, criminal lawyer or personal injury lawyer in and talk about, mm. you know, especially take like a woman in an empty parking garage. Sure they shouldn't just get the guy's hands off their throat. Um, <clears> they <throat> want to go a lot further and not just so they fall on the floor even. That's not enough. Mm. Uh, they need to not be able to get up or not want to get up, um, which means I think going beyond maybe what 
a lot of people would be comfortable with doing. Um, I, I err to a side probably because I haven't been in a, a lot of fights like you. Uh, I think that I would, because I have all these anger issues, I would probably go um, uh, really far with it. Mm. And I'd want to ensure like they're, I don't know, writhing in pain or <laughs> uh, unconscious. Yeah, or, yeah. And actually, well, if you I, give, give them an elbow to the face and they're going to be unconscious, Bob, possibly. Yeah, yeah. But I guess that's the problem, right? Because if you if you if they really want to hurt you and they're attacking you, you don't want to hit them and now enrage them and give them a chance to then retaliate and potentially hurt, do some serious damage to you. Because especially in a street fight, and if there's no one there to break it up, I, I mean, they could actually I mean, they could put you in a coma. They could do, you know, far worse. I mean, so mm -hmm. if there's no one to stop the fight. You almost and you still have a level head. You almost have to get it to the point where you've hit that tipping point where they're not going to come back but then that's the problem is um if if they if that wasn't their intention then uh, that's you know it's a terrible situation so yeah. i think and that maybe kind of brings to us to the jiu-jitsu thing is like you you with jiu-jitsu the whole point is you you want to get them to the ground that's number one because all the power comes from them standing up and then you want to get past their powerful leg. So they're not kicking you in the head. Cause again, that's the next most powerful thing. So you get them to the ground, you get past their legs. And then essentially you just want to pin that person. Now, once I pin them, so I get past their legs and their hips. Once I pin them, um, you can get on top. If you're on the mounted position, you can, you can, so you're sitting on top of them. You can hit them in the face, but they can't hit you. Or you could put on a choke or whatever, but they can't hurt you. So it's almost like you take them down, you get past the legs, you pin them, and then you start to see if this person's going to calm down. You can start having a conversation. Maybe you can give them a slap to say, wake up. Um, but I, I find at that point, they actually, after about 30 seconds, most people are gassed completely. Yeah. They've drained everything. They're huffing and puffing. And if you're already sitting on them, they can't breathe. Um, it's they start to calm down and you can say, listen, mate, you're in a bad spot here. And then, you know, you have the potential to just obviously get up and walk away. Or if they're still flipping out, you can give them a smack. But then I feel like at least you, you haven't destroyed their face and broken an arm or something. And again, the only risk is his or her or their mates standing yeah. around. If it's a multiple situation, you, you actually have to still deal with this guy in such a way that he doesn't come up while you're trying not to get kicked in the face from, whoever's standing around but yeah i think from a crawl versus jujitsu perspective that's probably the one benefit is when you get them on the ground again you have to get them to the ground first um you can really control yeah. the amount of intensity and damage that's dealt yeah. Uh, yeah so let me let me ask you guys a question from from a guy who doesn't know either you know crawl or jujitsu and i i had a situation about well, must have been about a year ago now and i was getting my tires changed uh, at a local tire place. And I was, uh, so I left the place and I was going to go get some coffee. And so I'm crossing like this, um, this uh, road that was not a, you know, it was kind of a, a parking lot road. Yep. Um, and this guy comes, you know, in his car comes, you know, really, really close to me. He came, he came flying by me and he came really, really close to me. And uh, as he went by, I just kind of, you know, I gave him the finger because he was, I mean, he almost brushed my pants. That's how close he was. Yep. So uh, he gets out of the car and he starts coming towards me. Right? Yep. And the very first thing that I did is, uh, believe it or not, and I don't know, I don't know why I did this, but I just said, okay, what are my resources? Mm. Uh, because I didn't have anything on me. Mm. And I, so I looked around and I, and, and there was a rock about as big as my fist. Yep. So I, I picked up the rock because I just, it just came to me. It's like, okay, you know, this guy's coming at me, you know, like he's going to hurt me. So mm. I've got to find some resources here. Mm. So I, I found a rock and I picked up a rock about the size of my fist. And he said, I'm a disabled vet. And I said, in a few minutes, you're going to be a lot more. Disabled. <laughs> oh no. Uh, and, uh, and he backed off. He just left. <clears throat> But was he saying that he was a disabled vet, like as in to say, look, I'm sorry, I or, or no, was he actually? No, he was coming at me like, you know, you gave me the fucking finger and I'm oh. a disabled vet. And he was coming like right at me, really fast at me. 
Oh, so he was saying like, listen, I've got some wartime experience, some combat. I'm coming. Exactly. Get, like, exactly. Oh. But, and, and, and so that's what, and I just, I don't know, it just came out of my mouth. And I said, well, in a few more minutes, you're going to be a little bit more disabled. Um, and, uh, you know, he just, he backed off. He was, he never got within five feet of me. Yep. Uh, but, you know, I was able to diffuse it and I don't really understand why, um, mm. but I think, you know, just thinking like, I mean, keeping a cool head yep. uh, is just something I tend to do in those situations. Yep. Um, and I just looked around and said, okay, you know, we're going to do this. So let's see what I've got. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting, actually. I wonder what you picking up the rock, I wonder what, if that was part of the effect of him, like just letting go of the situation, or I wonder if you picking up the rock actually could escalate it and make him go back to his car and pull a gun out of his it glove could. box or something. It, it, like, could, it probably could have. Yeah. Yeah. I think it it's, could have gone either way. Yeah. Um, he was kind of crazy. He was kind of crazed, you know, he got that crazy look in his eye. Yeah. Well, I, I know that I had a, cra a really crazy look in my, in my youth. I used to get into so many fights, especially after I got out of the army yeah. I would just inst I would just instigate fights with just about anybody because I yeah. I, th I think I had self esteem issues and I also think I wanted to test I was like always wanted to test myself yeah um, but yeah. maybe in his maybe in his case he was just having a bad day I mean who knows it could have been yeah, yeah. it could have been and, and I just when I gave him the finger it just set him off but I mean he almost hit me you know yeah yeah uh, you, do you guys use any weapons in Krov? Or like, are you just, or do you always take the weapon? I mean, do you, do you actually take the knife? Do you practice knife fighting? Do you, do you practice like using sticks or batons or anything? Or is it all just disarming and then using your bare hands? Yeah, it's an emphasis really, um, or it's reflective of our litigious society that it's always get it away, toss it, especially if you can away from where you are with this guy. Yep. Because if anyone comes on the scene, especially a cop and the guns in your hand, that's uh, that's a big problem. But some of the people do go to the point of of just practicing uh, tactically using a gun. Mm. Like if there's a, a, a someone in the building who's shooting the place up and you can get your hands on a gun, how do you handle yourself? Uh, but yeah, no, we don't, we don't practice any fighting with uh, a weapon, which, uh, yeah, if you really want to be effective, uh, you might want to learn some more about that. Mm -hmm. If I were in the army, um, I would sure want to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did, um, I did some Kali training for, you know, Kali Screamer Sticks, so using basically the bamboo sticks which is a Filipino martial art. I did that for a while and um, that really opened my eyes because in that, well, with the place that I was training at, you've got uh, headgear on, you've got pads on, and then you're using a training stick, which is basically, um, it's like a piece of PVC or something wrapped in foam in place of the actual um, bamboo stick. And then once you get more senior, you'll actually spar with those. But what, what was cool about that is all striking was allowed um, grappling was allowed, takedowns were allowed. So we would start with the sticks. And um, it, especially coming from a jujitsu and a boxing background, it really opened my eyes what kind of damage you could do with a stick. Like if you're trying to come in for a takedown and the guy's cracking you in the head or even the reach, like if another guy has a blade, your, your attacks on the bladed hand and, th uh, you know, the hand holding the blade and things like that. But even once you get to the ground, this was another interesting thing, um, the, the knife awareness. So once we, if one guy has a blade, you know, and he's still able to hold the blade, like I would try to take him down. And then all of my focus is on maintaining that blade hand to free the blade and then start administering the submission. But man, when you start going up against guys with knives and sticks, it's, it's so fast. The knife attacks that can come at you are so fast. And if the guy's aggressive, like it's almost you're hundred percent guaranteed you will get cut. The guy is going to cut you. Um, yeah. And it's almost a matter of just, can you control it? But I guess the point, I guess the point I was going to make is it just opened my eyes always being in the jujitsu world thinking, Oh yeah, we're going to have a nice clean fight. 
Uh, I'm going to take you down. And then all of a sudden I pull over and Don walks over with a rock and cracks me in the head with a rock. And I'm like, well, there's 12 years of jujitsu down the toilet. <laughs> oh. No, that's, that's true. We, yep. we practice that sometimes if we have more senior people in the training, we'll have uh, one against four. And even every one of those four guys either has a, uh, a mock-up of a tire iron or a knife, a gun, and you're kind of being attacked continuously, but we aren't doing it strong enough or mm. violently enough to make it, uh, to make it real. Um, I was, I was going to say too, when you were talking to make me think about, or this whole discussion about uh, changing perception or mindset um, of the attacker, that's kind of a tenant of Krav that I like is um, you're trying to violate norms and do what they would not expect. Like one of the first things that's not expected in our culture, especially when you're younger, is you don't go around kicking another guy in the groin. Mm. Uh, and that's probably the first thing we do. Um, they aren't expecting it. It, uh, it can make them you know, double over and then you can do more things. But uh, it's that, it's hitting in the throat. They don't expect that. Um, just uh, whatever you can do to, it's like the opportunities are doing things that people don't expect you to do. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm getting on that, as Don knows, I've been perseverating on that lately when it comes to solving problems. I, I think I'm looking at one that to begin with, it was, uh, uh, it seemed like a physical problem, a technical one. Mm -hmm. And then after looking at it closer, I could see it involves uh, capability or physiology of the person, how well how fast can they recognize something and react? Uh, mm -hmm. What's typical response time? And then finally took it a step further. And that was, what was the thinking process? What was, what was the, either the rational or irrational assumptions that person was making? And that's where the largest opportunity was. Um, in, in that if you could address the, the mindset that's at the heart of why you're even in this bad situation, mm. um, then you make a huge difference. However, people don't feel comfortable thinking they can understand that around another person. You know, what are their motivations? And even less is what do you do about it? How can I, um, how can I combat that uh, mindset? You don't have much time to do all that. <clears throat> um, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's right. I mean, it's, it's like with me and the guy, right? I mean, I had a matter of seconds. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Well, I mean, in this didn't case. Have, didn't have time to psychoanalyze him. <laughs> you know, it's like, tell me about your mother. You know? So this is way ahead of time to try to prevent the, these things from happening. But um, so it, I probably rambled on with you before to Mike uh, rear end collisions. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot you can do if you're, if you work for Ford or Toyota focusing on the braking system, there's a lot you can do if you're a classical human factors engineering engineer, you'll focus on reaction time, perception, uh, things like that. And then Nobody, it seems, looks at, well, why do people feel it's so safe or why do people follow so close to the car in front of them? Mm. That's, that has so much more of an impact on the likelihood of a accident than anything else. Yes, but, 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 but through the very most basic of differential equations, your car can inform you when you are too close just by taking the derivative of velocity over time and, 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 and a red light goes on and, and, and just says, okay, pal, you know, you're, you're, even if you want to stop, you couldn't. Uh, I so, on cars that have that, can you switch that off? 
Oh, yeah, I'm sure you probably could, you know, it, but, you know, I mean, let's say if it, even if it was just a light, a red light or a yellow light or a green light, you know, something like that would inform you that your distance is, is not, um, it, it, it is not uh, 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 lining up with what the car is capable of, even if your reflexes were perfect. Yeah, well, so the a, car, so the car a, would know what the stopping distance is based on your velocity, and and then in, and then it would be like almost like a negative reinforcer, like the seatbelt. You know how it beeps until you plug it in. So it'd be that negative reinforcer, where it's just beeping and beeping and beeping until you create the following distance that the car can actually stop within. That's that right. sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's it's very simple. I mean, it's a simple equation. It's basic calculus. I mean, mm -hmm. if someone felt well, I guess the thing is. And I can send it to you if you want to look at it sometime. There are so many really strong motivations that people have that you don't think about to tailgate the guy in front of you. You know, they're, they're sick and tired of people driving so slow on a freeway or they think to themselves, I've never been in an accident like that before. It's, I can, I'll be okay um, mm -hmm. driving. Yeah. Over. Sure, sure. Or yeah. if the likelihood of the guy in front of me slamming on their brakes, in my mind, is so low, I'll risk it. And, mm -hmm. and so there's a whole bunch of things that, I mean, I, as we move towards autonomous cars, it's uh, going to really change the game. But I think a lot of people would find it very frustrating not to have the complete freedom to... Uh, drive as fast as they want, switch lanes really fast, especially if you bought some new high powered vehicle or, or a motorcycle or something. Um, it, however, well, um, you know, it's also, you know, if, if you had, let's say um, a car with a proximity sensor in, in it, that obviously it knows your velocity, uh, it, it knows the distance between you and the car in front of you. Um, it calculates, you know, the, the braking time, you know, as a result of those uh, factors, right? Mm -hmm. um, you could also look at it like um, if what, what happens when, you know, the, the, the person in front of you that does not have this technology breaks for no particular reason, and that ripples all the way down through the chain, which causes an accident way down there in the back, right? Because somebody's off guard. And, and everybody's following too closely, right? So you get this ripple effect that you can see, you can actually, there have been experiments that actually uh, replicate uh, the effect of somebody braking. Well, if all the cars had that, you would actually get to your destination a lot faster because, because uh, there wouldn't be that reactive sensation from the, from the driver that doesn't really understand uh, the braking uh, that, that they needed to break at that time or the, or the intensity of that breaking. So it wouldn't create that ripple effect. Yeah. So, I mean, things would move more quickly. Mm. You would hope so. Um, oh, it would move more quickly. There's I no I send it to you, Don. I don't know if I sent it to you, Michael. I can, I can do that. I saw, I listened to a podcast by Malcolm Gladwell. You probably know who that is. Yep. Um, he was talking all about autonomous vehicles with Neil deGrasse Tyson, that guy who thinks he's Einstein or something. Um, but uh, he was saying how, because Malcolm is a runner, um, he mm -hmm. took a ride in, a, in one of those, uh, what's it called, Waymo vehicles that's autonomous, mm. and was fascinated when he got out of the vehicle, he went and tried to just mess with or see what happens with different sensors. And he realized that they all keep track of everything so much and prevent those kind of collisions from happening that he and his buddies could go running down the middle of the freeway at rush hour and have no fear of getting hit. It would slow everyone down quite a bit, mm. but it changes the whole dynamic that all of a sudden, it's cars mm. who take the responsibility. Mm. Even though it's not a person, but it's as if the car now takes responsibility and the, the pedestrian doesn't have to be in fear for their life 
wherever they are in relationship to a car. Because um, one of the, the- I'm a little, I'm a little hesitant of the, using the word responsibility because that gives the car agency. The car is just an algorithm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I may have mentioned before too is in a situation where there were a lot of accidents in Holland, this guy came up with the idea, you know, every time I put a traffic engineer, we put more things in place to control cars that they don't run into each other, don't run into a bicyclist. He would try getting rid of all signs, all lights, all lane markers, everything, such that now the driver going through has no confidence on what's going to happen. They actually have to make eye contact. It's, it's like if you come up to an intersection here during the monsoon season and all of a sudden the lights are out, you go real carefully through that intersection. Um, so, and, and it, instead of each one of the little or the things like adding more lights and controls, which reduce the accident rate maybe by three to 5%, making that move reduced it like by 85%. Uh -huh. um, yeah. And he claimed that it didn't slow down the overall traffic flow. Right. But that's the kind of uh, extreme, fascinating solution concept that in a way I consider just to be uh, like society is not ready for that. We, we, we don't, uh, you know, drivers enjoy the idea that if the light is green or even if it turned yellow, as long as I have a fast enough car, I can, you know, really hit the gas and just zoom through because I know that there isn't going to be anyone on the side who's going to push it either. So no one's going to be pulling out. So I'll be perfectly fine. And, and that <clears throat> is where that false confidence causes horrible accidents. I, I think there, there, there's a function of density of traffic there too, because I've, I've seen exactly the opposite. Yeah. Um, so I've driven in Taiwan before. Have you ever driven in Taiwan? No, not Taiwan, no. but I've been in, you know, other countries where that, you know, yeah, in Shenzhen, I mean, Bali, even Th Thailand is this yeah. very much, Bangkok's very much the same. Yeah. It probably, it probably is very much the same. If you, if you go through a green light in mm. Taiwan, you're, you're taking your life in your hands mm. uh, because, uh, because nobody, the lights are suggestions mm. why, and they're not enforced. Um, so you go through a green light and um, it, it's absolutely, that's insanity. Everybody stops at green lights. Um, you stop at green lights, you stop at red lights, you stop at yellow lights, you, or you go through all three of them. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, whether they're there or they're not there uh, is immaterial, yeah. uh, you know, because there's so much traffic on the road and people are getting everywhere. And, and you've got, uh, you've got motor scooters on your right and on your left and they, tr and, and they even change lanes. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, they get to where they're going. I don't know how they do it. I've never, or maybe you guys have seen it. Do, do we know of any data that says, even though it looks so unsafe, what is their accident rate in comparison to the well-controlled Western uh, sorts mm -hmm. of I don't know. Yeah, good question now, I haven't. It's a good question. But then I guess the next piece is what, you know, if you, whether you took away all the traffic lights or you just had a really congested environment, what is the, like you could actually measure the flow and you could actually look at the frequency of accidents. And then you'd have to compare that against if you had autonomous vehicles, now what is the flow and the frequency of accidents? And surely if I have to sit and scan and look everybody in the eye, that's not as efficient as a car with all of its sensors and cameras everywhere, just going boop. Uh -huh. you know, and, and going straight through the intersection. Right. Yeah, I think uh, autonomous vehicles end with maybe just uh, light or sensors in the intersection that helps to guide or tell each car, uh, yeah, why don't you go ahead and go through? Mm. You know, you could essentially have cars coming from every direction and not mm. hit each other. Yep. But also not have to slow down. Yep. Be crazy. It depends on it kind of depends on how many sensors you have. You know, I mean <laughs> you know, yep. yeah, yeah. You um you're only you're limited to the number of sensors you have. 
or, or if every car was on the same network, right? If everybody was on that Google Maps and Google actually could read the the speed and the location of every single yeah. car, then it wouldn't. You yeah, yeah. you would you'd you'd be able to go straight through. That's yeah, true. I, I I don't know about in many of these cases is would society tolerate it? Personally, take it almost feels like taking away freedom. Um, mm. And if I had a new gas powered, uh, you know, internal combustion engine, uh, F type Jaguar, I would not want anything messing with me. Mm. I, I'd, I'd want to utilize that. And uh, so I, I, I guess I wonder with everyone, are they going to be willing to eventually sit back and read the paper while they go to work uh, in a car? Um, I think that'd be great. Just Uber everywhere. Nobody owns a car. You just rent them. Yeah. But you're well, right. I There's guess... di the difference in culture. Like in Australia, it's um, because there's so many speed cameras. There's mobile speed cameras everywhere. You see a lot less hotheads. You see a lot less, you know, they call them hoons speeding around. So even yeah. if you've got, even if you have a fast car, you just, it's not nearly the same as when I was living in LA where, um, you, when you get on the freeway, it's like you're on the Autobahn. Well, right. no, right. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, or yeah. even, even, even just in the city, people are just, you know, in and out of cars. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. so I think it's a, it's a, it is a cultural thing. It's, um, and it depends a lot on the rest of the infrastructure that super system, right? What visibility do we have? Is there a camera on every corner? Can I see everything you're doing? So maybe that's the first pass is that, yeah, you're, you're still free to step on the accelerator of your F type and go hundred miles an hour through here. However, we're watching you, and when you get home, there's going to be a ticket in your mail. I think it was Dubai, actually, where the ticketing is automatic, right? So they, the camera sees you. It picks you up, and guess what? It's You've got a ticket. It doesn't even have to go to your mail. You just get the fine. Same with Singa it. Singapore. is the same way. <clears throat> yeah. Singapore is worse, as a matter of fact, because they, they tax you on top of that. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're the same. There's cameras on. Every, they're watching every move you make. Yep. So I, I, I think you get to that point, then it's like, well, who cares? Whatever. I might as well have an autonomous autonomous vehicle vehicle because yeah. I can't speed ever anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That would be a little more enlightened than my caveman approach to it. <laughs> but you know, if you have if everybody had autonomous vehicles, and let's say we cut down accidents by, I don't know, 50% or something. I'm just pulling the number out. Okay. <laughs> Um, economically, that's not very good for the car industry. Uh, the automobile industry wouldn't like that. They like accidents. Uh, you destroy cars that way. Um, and you have to buy new ones when you destroy old ones. Uh, even if you total them out, uh, you know, because of insurance purposes. Uh, so economically, um, you would have large industries fighting against you, uh, if you tried to, uh, if you try to do that. Well, may maybe that ties into like what we do with mobile phones and that sort of thing now like you know that that car only has a three-year life and uh then it's obsolete so then you're going to trade it in and you never really or maybe you, you we just never really own cars anymore you right. lease the car for three years but so maybe that then push pushes back on the auto industry to say you're not going to make your money by um by building new cars because of accidents and things like that but you're going to make more money by turning them over out of obsolescence mm -hmm. um, and the, the, is, yeah. it, is it Singapore actually? Or what, what country is it that you can't have a car that's over, um, I think something like five or 10 years old. You can't actually, is it Japan? I think it's Japan. If yeah. it's over 10 years old or something, you can't register it. That's it. I don't, I don't remember that. Yeah, it could be Japan. That sounds like something a Japanese would do. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it, it's also, you know, kind of changing the subject a little bit, but it's also the reason why we don't have high-speed rail in this country. Uh, we don't have high-speed rail because of the car industry and because of the airline industry, uh, because high-speed rail would compete with their revenues um, and the airlines are already hurting. Uh, they're already suffering billions. Um, so, um, you know, no, you're not gonna get any, any lobby uh, in there that's powerful enough to defeat those two mm. to get high-speed rail going from anywhere to anywhere. Mm. Well, that's the, uh, that's, was sort of the prevalent idea back before electric cars were mm -hmm. seen as they had any chance was the word was that you know the automotive industry definitely doesn't want to have that happen mm -hmm. they said you know people like ford 
were just buying up all the patents they could really in an order to stop anyone from doing anything uh, with it. But eventually, I guess the thing that I think is interesting when it comes to developing what we might think are really clever, potentially very effective solutions, society might not be ready for it. And it, maybe it can happen, and that could be a long-term direction, but thinking you're going to be able to implement it tomorrow uh, might be uh, foolhardy or something. I think you know, what's, fool, what's foolhardy is to think that society makes the decisions. Society doesn't make any decisions. Industry makes all the decisions. Oh, yeah. And they're... And that's all driven by economics and self-interest. And what can they get the average Joe to spend their money on? Um, I can keep you, you know, uh, you know, buying, you know, my car, um, then uh, I stay in business. Yeah. So that that is no quick thing to impact either. No, uh, no. You know, I think we were saying the other day, Don, to take care of the problem of all the plastic bottles and so on floating around in the ocean is if someone could find a way to make money, lots of money off all that, it'd be mm-hmm. cleared up mm-hmm. in, a, in a year. Um, yep. Sure. I mean, maybe maybe a requirement if, you know, if, if society were, let's say, in charge, which is kind of a fantasy, um, and we would just say that, um, that every car has to be, uh, you know, I'll use 50% again, 50% recyclable. Yeah. Um, so that I'm not producing a car from brand new, you know, materials every time I build one. Uh, so I, I you know, think- that might be, an, that might be, uh, yeah, I think that would be pretty difficult to, to push, but uh, it might be an idea to, to build in a little bit of ecology with manufacturing. Mm. Well, maybe uh, <clears throat> I, I think a lot about these solutions and immediately I, I discount them because, oh, no one will ever take that or, you know, people don't give a damn, which is my normal mantra. Um, But uh, it's like something like trees could also be used on that problem. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, here's a, a really difficult problem that speaks to why something isn't happening. And that would then also get you into a lot of, I think, interesting stuff that you learn from uh, sociologists, social psychologists, um, as well as industry trends, um, but into a whole different area. Um, Depending on how you ask the question, yeah, yeah. If you would, uh, you know, and this is where the this is where the art, I think, of trees comes in is how you ask the question. Yeah. Um, you know, if I ask the question, for example, of, you know, how do I relocate somebody from one place to another place? And what is the distance between those two places? And is that a factor? Um, you know, if it's a close distance, then I might have a different solution. If that distance is much further, then I'll have another solution, right? Uh, but depending on how we phrase that question, how simply we can ask it, we could start um we could start exploding, you know, with some ideas that are pretty much out of the box. Mm. Well, and we one we've talked about before, I think all three of us is uh, masks and vaccines. Um, you can make the vet best vaccine or mask in the world, but there are other really strong motivators that a good deal of the society um, will completely ignore. And if you are determined, though, to get them accepted, what's, how do you make that happen? Um, if that's the big roadblock, do you just give up and say, you know, well, and some people are doing, they're saying, well, I guess we won't have those people in the gene pool much longer. Hmm. Um, you know, they, they kind of look like, well, each side does this kind of accusing the other ones of being naive or or stupid or whatever um but it's a, it's a a major consideration for- see that's something that that's something that bothers me whenever i see it um when i see it framed 
uh, in a comical way. Mm. Uh, somebody's lost their life uh, because they were an anti-vaxxer. And, and the comedy is that they were a Trump supporter or they were just dumb or something like that. And to me, it's still a tragedy. It's still a loss of life, you know? It's, it's not something to make light of. Um, and uh, and, and uh, getting through those barriers um, is, is, to me, the big question. Why did you decide uh, mm. to take this particular pathway? Mm. Um, you know, any, any loss of life that's unnecessary um, is, is, is not, is not, uh, it, it, it's not, uh, you know, the, the thing like everyone says, well, it's Darwin taking over, you know, well, yeah, fine. Okay. Well, mm. that's, that's not a good enough answer for me. Yeah. But then, then you're getting into some really complex stuff around who are the people that are influencing this individual? What is the environment? What is the time they grew up in? Where, what's their socioeconomic status? And then it puts them in this echo chamber where they're only hearing from the people they want to hear from and their Facebook feed is whatever it is because of the people they talk to. And it's almost like you, you have to go, um, maybe not a level deep, but you have to actually go out like multiple levels to find out where all of these super systems are interacting with these people and what is the what are all the causal agents that are creating their environment and that's exactly I mean, right yeah that's exactly right and and um yeah and i'm personally invested in exactly yeah. that <clears throat> i've been intrigued by that question again i go back to my main source <laughs> youtube videos because mm. it's more interesting than reading some papers but sure. um the the gist of the ones i've been looking at is it, it, uh, you can't convince people with facts, mm. um, or some people with facts. I don't know how yeah. you'd say that more precisely, but as much as we want to, because we maybe consider ourselves more uh, sophisticated or intelligent or whatever, um, you, it's just we're being too stubborn if we mm. think shutting well, that facts down their throat will do it. Yeah, because you've got these people and you look at sort of rational versus intuitive decision making, these people are just, they're not rational. And I, this is something I struggle with every day in business is you, you're an intuitive person, right? So you listen to your gut. You, it, in that case, it doesn't matter how much data I show you about the fact that you're hemorrhaging cash, this project's not going to work, you're going to lose money. It, that, it, they, it doesn't matter what I put in front of them. And I think it might be the same thing with a lot of these folks that are, I, I don't know, but I'm thinking with these anti-vaxxers, again, it, if they're not thinking about the data and the facts, then it doesn't matter what data and facts we show them yeah. because they're, they're appealing to, uh, to something else, something in their gut. But then the question is, where, what is informing your gut? It's, where I, are you getting yeah, that, that's, it's an interesting way of putting it, but I, I think it's more of a metaphor that you're looking for rather than gut. Because we have, we have metaphors of life that we live by and these actually mm. these actually form ideologies and sometimes they form dogmas mm. and uh, so information that is presented to us um, uh, is is presented to this particular ideology this particular metaphor mm. and it, it it is either if it agrees with it uh, then like in your echo chamber for example then mm. then it goes into the metaphor very nicely and you incorporate it um, if it doesn't agree with it, then you've got two choices. You can either reject it altogether, or you can, uh, actually three choices. You can reject it altogether, or you can mutate it, that information. You can twist it around so it fits your metaphor, uh, or you can accept it as is, which means you have to change your model of the world and how you've modeled the world. And that presents you, that puts you in a position of chaos. That's put you in a position of uncertainty, when you uh, where you are not confident any longer of, of what you hold to be true, at least in this one case. And metaphors tend to overlap with other metaphors. And this is actually how we think. So we think uh, in the right brain in a very gestalt way. Um, and th that's where we see the whole picture. It's the left brain that actually takes it apart and puts the pieces together and figures out whether it's logical or not. And these two hemispheres are arguing back and forth all the time. Uh, so depending on the predominance of one or another, uh, you know, 
Uh, if one can convince the other, then that side wins. And that's how we think, believe it or not. It's kind of a crazy, screwed up way of thinking. Uh, but if you're, if, you're, if you're heavily invested um, in, in, a particular, uh, in a particular way of thinking, and that thinking is holistically, then the details are not going to affect you one bit. Yeah. Mm. I, there's, there's so many big challenges right in there as far as what one could take on for a fascinating um, you know, exercise to come up with solutions. It, it's like what what aspect, what as yeah, what aspect would you even start with? Um, and and it uh, I was gonna mention too the the other complicating factor is that I see in myself and in other people, a manager, for instance, enjoys the fact that they believe if people aren't doing something, I can come down on them with a big hammer and yell at them and that'll somehow make things happen. And the fact of the matter is that that really isn't, isn't very reliable and it's the same thing with kids. You can be really strict on them, give them all kinds of punishment, and that's not going to bring about the desired behavior. Yet, it's what we lose. We realize we don't have control when we can't force people. Um, and of course, everything comes down again to my mantra, which is people don't care. <laughs> Yeah. Well, they don't care, care until what point, I guess. And that's the question is when, at what point do people care? Is it at the point where you're already up in flames and we've lost everything, but that that's actually really interesting, you know? So are we saying then it's not about the, the hardest problem isn't about the solution generate generation or contradiction solving from Triz where we, we solve the impossible problem. Great. Good on you. You're never going to implement it because the person doesn't want it implemented. So that's actually the real challenge. It's not, it's not solving the problem. It's getting the problem implemented and accepted on the part of the individual or the society. I would go, I would go, yeah, maybe a step further and, and say that it's, um, that it's um, how we frame that problem, which goes mm. back to, which goes back to the definition, kind of the very basic definition of trees. Okay. Uh, it goes back to the old clothes dryer thing, you know, design me a clothes dryer. Okay. Everybody designs a, a clothes dryer. And then we say, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to relocate moisture and that's your job. Well, then you've got a million different, you know, answers to the problem than you do if I say design a clothes dryer. Okay, so how we frame the problem, uh, if we can frame it to appeal uh, to uh, a large uh, mass, then they will accept the premise of that frame and then we can bring them along the way. But if we don't frame it pro uh, properly to start with, we don't even get to start. Yeah. Well, one of the solutions, I, I just a thought that one of these people talked about was they thought it was pretty successful when they interacted. Uh, maybe it was a relative again. They didn't challenge the person like how stupid you are or anything. Instead, somehow they casually showed some information, maybe some pictures that showed what the world looked like before there was a vaccine for measles um, and how painful it was mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how prevalent it was. Isn't it great that we don't have that? Right, right. So well, you know, you know uh, polio, uh, yeah, never, yeah. Reached, polio yeah. never reached herd immunity. Yeah. Uh, polio, uh, polio was eliminated because people took the vaccine hmm. and they didn't question it back then. Yeah, they never reached herd immunity though. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, and and but you didn't have you didn't have so many uh, back then when when there was polio, you, you didn't have a bunch of people saying that they questioned science. In fact, in fact, you know, science was kind of a god back then. You know, doctors were kind of demigods, right? Nobody questioned a doctor. He said he said take the vaccine. You took the vaccine. That's why polio was eliminated. But now we're, we're a lot smarter, right? You know, so, so, uh, so now we, 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 I guess we, we question everything. It, we would, I think what I really mean is that we're dumber. But what do, you, what do you think, Michael, is, or can you tell us about the difference in, 
in the way people think or the Australian society, whatever, mm. how does it compare in terms of the amount of uh, disbelief in science or disbelief in things that appear to be factual? Um, and I, yeah. I don't know if you stay up on what the current climate is here right now <laughs> pertaining to that. Mm. Uh, we, we view it as really extreme but uh, I'm wondering how it is there. I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't been, I've been outside of the US for a while now, but um, yeah, I don't feel like the skepticism and the, you know, the crazy fringe theories have anywhere near the traction in Australia that they do in the US. But in, but in saying that, um, you know, you just take va like COVID vaccination rates as a good example. Australia is not, like we have the lowest, right, out of like I think the OECD countries, um, but I don't necessarily think it's because they're they're um, anti-vaxxers and they're uh, that I don't think it's a that sort of thing. I think it's more that there's a level of complacency here because of the um, you know just like fin financially the, this country is doing pretty well and most people are doing pretty well and there isn't really this impetus, impetus to move. But I don't feel like it's about skepticism and things like that. I think the U.S. is very, very, very different. And almost, you know, I talked to family members and friends back in the States. And even when Trump was in office and I just listened to some of the stuff coming from people. And it's weird being outside the U.S. because we don't consume all that media hype and spin. We've got our own spin here. But you can look in on it and just look and say, what is going on? Like, how, how are you even getting those? Where, where is that even coming from? Um, so I feel like it's definitely not the same here in Australia, but Australia has its own um, challenges. But yeah. I, I don't feel like people are um, are thinking that uh, they're being microchipped with their um, <laughs> with their vaccine. But yeah. who knows? Maybe they are. Maybe maybe Americans are onto something. No, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's I can assure weird. you, Americans aren't under <laughs> anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They. Uh... Um, I was just going to say, as far as the, the climate here, Don and I have talked about it a fair amount that it's getting really kind of uh, frightening mm. as to which way things could go. There's just too many people who still support so many radical conspiracies. Mm. Um, and it could really go in a horrible direction. Mm. Um, yeah, so some of the stuff I thought was really interesting is what's happened in um, university, well, colleges, right, universities, where those, they used to be safe, you used to be able to just challenge anything, and then people that have quite, I don't know, I, I think sound arguments that are backed pretty well by research and stuff, those folks get up there, and they're just, they, they're almost deplatformed, they're ripped apart by these folks that, um, especially in university settings should just not be able to do that. I'm not going to go into specific examples and stuff, but you know, of all places, you'd think universities were kind of like this bastion where you could, you could have free thinking, but at the same time, you could actually put decent arguments on the table and get support. But now it's like, Oh, that's too, we, we can't have this person speak. Well, you know, I mean, Mike, that's, that's because you think that universities are a place to go and learn things instead mm. of a business that makes money. Mm. And if you're a business that makes money, then um, you have got a charter that is very, very different from a business that is there to uh, teach critical thought. Mm. Um, you want to get as many people in the door and out the door as possible, keep them there as long as possible, charge them as much as possible. Um, and, uh, and secondarily, uh, you know, would come, you know, this piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Along with that piece of paper is going to be a boatload of bias. Yeah, so yeah that's it, right. You know, the president of Arizona State University wants to be on really good terms with whoever is governor, no matter what they're thinking, because the governor is instrumental in determining how much money is going to be pumped into the university. Right. And, and right there, right there is your catalyst, right? That's what's going to influence the university and how they teach. Yeah.
yeah, I, I hate to even think about universities anymore. The, the, the feeling I really got was um, I couldn't introduce anything new or from the last 20 years because everyone had, uh, everyone who teaches there, when they were a lot younger, they learned what was new 20 or 30 years ago. And mm -hmm. that's what they continue to teach. And nobody wants anything different. Um, mm -hmm. they, I mean, I mean who, who, who these days, you know, at, at a young age, uh, teaches, of, uh, teaches the genocide of the Native Americans in a uh, basic history class. Yeah. Um, and, the, and goes into any type of detail of that and what, what happened, you know, during that time period, how horrific that was. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in order for this country to be what it is today, uh, it was it was uh, it, it was bloody. It was awful. It was, uh, you know, it was shameful. Um, and, uh, you know, who wants to get who wants to get into, uh, you know, who wants to get into, uh, you know, the, the beginnings of slavery uh, in, in this country? Yeah, I mean, slavery, of course, goes back to almost every country, but um, it, it's part of our past. You know, who wants to teach that? Right. Um, you know, they, they'd rather teach evolution, you know, versus uh, our, our creation versus evolution. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, it's easier to it's more palatable. Mm. Sounds good. OK, well, you all take it easy. Guys, appreciate it. Take all care. Right. Take all care. Right. See you.